Good evening. At no point should we ever come to Scripture and assume we know everything about it or that we can even understand it by ourselves. So let's pray to God and ask Him to help us understand what we read and look at tonight. Father in heaven, we come to you because you are the only one who can bring us into all truth. In fact, that's the promise that you make through your Holy Spirit, that you will do just that, that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. So we ask Him to do that this evening as we study your word, that He would guide us into all truth as we look at this incredible book. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray together. Amen. One of my biggest fears for myself, for my church, for Christians in general, is that we will turn into the rebellious Old Testament Israel. In First and Second Kings, uh, Old Testament Israel is um, in a mess, to say the least. But the problem was, is that they didn't recognize their mess. Or if they did recognize it, they just didn't care. God consistently sent prophets. He consistently sent uh, teachers to them who would call them back. Ezekiel um, stands in that line, in that tradition of prophets that would call the people of God to repentance and to return to Him. And yet they continued to rebel against Him and eventually found themselves in exile. And so Ezekiel sits by the Kaibar River and receives these visions from God and reports them to the people. Ezekiel announces the day of judgment. He announces the, uh, the impending doom uh, for the people of God. And so his ministry was long. His message was fierce and severe at times. And the text that we're going to look at tonight is one of those passages. In Ezekiel chapter 7, Ezekiel has just come off uh, reminding the people of the problems that they face and, and where they stand. He is dramatized. Uh, what's gone on in their life or what's going to come on, go on in their life in the, the siege and the eventual fall of Jerusalem. In chapter 6, he, he preaches against, through God's Word, uh, Israel's idolatry and the problems that they faced. Uh, he even laments, God laments over the fall of Jerusalem and the problems that His people have created at the end of chapter 6. But then when you get to chapter 7, you're reminded of why all of this happens. You're reminded of what is going on because in chapter 7, God speaks a very specific word of judgment to His people. He reminds them it is because of your sin that doom and judgment is coming upon you. There's no other reason. There's no other explanation. It is all because of your iniquity and your sin. You can't point the finger at anybody else. You can't point the finger at the foreign nations that are going to come against you. You can't point the finger at anybody other than ourselves in the way that we have acted. And my fear is that all too often God is showing us in His Word our own sin in our own lives and we are missing out on His warnings. And I pray tonight as we look at Ezekiel 7, this announcement of the day of the Lord, the day of wrath that was coming upon the people, we would be jolted and shocked into an awareness of our sin and to the what our sin will bring about if we are not repentant. If we don't turn to God, what will come about in our lives, in the lives of the people, of, even the people of God, um, if they do not repent. So look with me at Ezekiel chapter 7. We're not going to read every verse. We're going to look at a lot of them this evening. Starting in verse 1, he says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, this is what the Lord God says to the land of Israel. Now even though he says land of Israel, in chapter 6 he talked to the mountains of Israel, the, the picture is clear. He's talking about the people. Uh, he's talking about all the people that are in the land. He says, An end... An end has come on the four corners of the earth. The end is now upon you. I will send my anger against you and judge you, listen to this, judge you according to your ways. Now listen to that phrase, your. Listen for it as we read through these verses. I will punish you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity or spare you, but I will punish you for your ways, for your detestable practices within you. And then the final word of those verses, then, 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 after I do these things, you will know that I am the Lord. 
So he starts off the, the chapter just reminding the people of the judgment that is coming and why the judgment is coming. And he points out very clearly, it's because of your ways, your detestable practices, your ways, your detestable practices. He repeats himself. He says, he uses that phrase, your ways, your detestable practices. He says your ways because they may have justified their ways in their eyes. But he wants to remind them that in his eyes, those ways that they live in and that they act in, those are detestable practices according to him. Keep reading verse 5. Comes this announcement of judgment, this, this uh, reminder that it's not just coming, but it's even here now. He says, look, this is what the Lord God says. Look, one disaster after another is coming. An end has come. The end has come. It has awakened against you. Look, it's coming. Doom has come upon you, inhabitants of the land. The time has come. The day is near. There will be panic on the mountains and not celebration. Verse 8, I will pour out my wrath on you very soon. So verse 5, 6, and 7, he tells them, listen, you're not going to escape this forever. Paul says in Romans, where the other book we're looking at on Sunday mornings, he tells them, look, are, are you going to continually despise and, and test the grace of God? Do you not know that His kindness was meant to lead you to repentance? For years and years and years, God has put up with the detestable practices of these people in hopes that they would see His kindness and see His grace, to hear His word, and they would repent. But that hasn't happened, and the day has finally come when disaster is coming coming upon the people. They are going to have to pay the price for their sin. They're going to pay the price for the way that they have acted and the things that they have done in relationship to their God and the things that they have not done in relationship to their God. In verses 8 and 9, I want you to listen to how God is going to do this. He says it in multiple ways here. In verse 8 he says, I will pour out my wrath on you very soon. He's making promises as to what he's going to do, and the promises are multifaceted. He said, I will pour out my wrath on you very soon. I will exhaust my anger against you and judge you, again, according to your ways. I will punish you for all your detestable practices. Verse 9, I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will punish you for all your ways and for your detestable practices within you. And again, he closes this little segment of verses in verse 9 the same way he closed verse 4. I'm going to do all of this for a reason, so that you will know that I am the Lord. Now, you may say, well, why, why does God want them to know that He is the Lord, even if He's bringing all these things and all these uh, punishments against them? Well, you have to remember that even though God is doing all this, we're going to see later on in chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, even 12, that God is actually, He's going to send them into punishment. He's going to bring exile upon their lives. He's going to send them away. But what is going to happen is He is going to redeem a people in the end. He's going to have a remnant that He will call out and redeem. So the fact that He wants them to know that He is the Lord is not just so that they know who's bringing the punishment down upon them, but it's so they will repent of their sin once they see the punishment that comes upon them. It's as if God wants them to know who's bringing the punishment so they can see that and be thankful for that in the end to see how far they have strayed and that He is the one who is bringing them back even if it is a hard time to bring them back. He says, I will, you will know that it is I, the Lord, who strikes. Verse 10 says, here is the day, here it comes. This is in the same vein as, as verse uh, 5 and 6 and 7, that, that immediacy that, that it's coming, the impending judgment that cannot be escaped in verse 10. Here's the day, here it comes. Doom is on its way. The rod has blossomed. Arrogance has bloomed. Violence has grown into a rod of wickedness. None of them will remain, none of that crowd, none of their wealth, and none of the eminent among them. So what he does is he tells you, listen, it's coming, but then he get, begins to get specific in why it's going to come. And you can just see it laying in verse 10 and 11. The, the rod has bloomed and arrogance has bloomed. Violence has grown into a rod of wickedness. 
None of that crowd, none of their wealth, none of the eminent. One of the main problems with the people of Israel was the abuse of power for those who had power against those who didn't have power. And he says here, look, part of the reason of what is happening to you is because of the way that the, the rich and the wealthy and the powerful among you have treated those who were not. It's something we have to guard in our own lives. The haves cannot abuse the have-nots. N- neither can abuse either party. But that is was especially the problem here. The time has arrived, verse 12. The day has arrived. Let the buyer not rejoice, for the seller not mourn. He goes on in 12 and 13 to say, listen, even your regular business practices, the redemption of land and the buying and selling of land, none of that is going to matter anymore because so many of you are going to perish in what is about to come. He says at the end of verse 13, none will preserve his life. Verse 14 and 15, again, details some of the calamity that's going to fall upon the people and even so far as to tell them that listen no place is safe nowhere you can run nowhere you can hide is safe from the reach of God's judgment upon his people they've blown the trumpet prepared everything but no one goes to war for my wrath is on her whole crowd the sword is on the outside plague and famine are on the inside whoever in the field will die by the sword famine and plague will devour whoever is in the city so whether you're flee from the city or whether you're stuck in the city, either way, you're going to face judgment. You're going to face judgment. There is a theme just pumping through these verses that no one is safe, that all will face judgment. Some will even lose their lives. He says in in verse 16, there will be some survivors who will escape. They'll live in the mountains like the doves of the valley. All of them will moan. Watch this. Those who survive, they will moan. Why? Not because they've lost their land, not because they lost Jerusalem, not because they've lost any of that. They will moan and they will groan. Why? Because each over his own iniquity. The people's sin will be exposed by the judgment of God and they will then see it and know that He is the Lord and they will be in repentance and groaning because of the iniquity. Verse 19 says that they will throw their silver into the streets and their gold will seem some, like something filthy. Their silver and gold will be unable to save them in the day of the Lord's wrath. They will not satisfy their appetites or fill their stomachs. Why? Because these were stum- the stumbling blocks, blocks that brought about their iniquity. Like verses 10 and 11, here in verse 19, he's showing some of the issues that were created by the people. He says they, their gold, their silver, those who had riches were corrupted by them. They would use that gold and they would use that silver to indulge their lifestyle and however they wanted to live. They, couldn't, they would satisfy their stomachs. And so he says, listen, the exact opposite is going to occur. Your gold and silver are going to be like nothing to you because they're not going to be of any use to you because the food that you would normally buy and indulge yourself in, maybe at the expense of those who were less fortunate than you, none of it's it's not even going to be available. So your money is going to be worth nothing in these days. In verse 20, he speaks of the blessings that he has given the people. He gave them beautiful ornaments for majesty, but they flipped those beautiful ornaments on their head and they made them detestable images and made abhorrent things from them. So he says, I have made these into something filthy to them. I will hand these things over to foreigners as plunder and to the wicked of the earth as spoil and they will profane them. So the blessing, the very blessings that God has poured out, he will turn to something filthy. He will turn those things into something that the people will look on with disdain because it's a symbol of all that has happened to them. He says in verse 22, I will turn my face. This is maybe the most condemning verse in the whole chapter. I will turn my face from them as they profane my treasured place. The treasured place is probably talking about the temple. Violent men are going to enter it and profane it. He's looking forward to what's going to happen when siege falls upon Jerusalem. But just think about that for the people of Israel. Those people who had walked in covenant with God. And yet here, they're dwelling in the promised land. And yet they're going to face this reality. I will turn my face from them as they profane my treasured place. Listen to me. The people of God cannot get away with doing whatever they want. We can't. God sees and God knows. If we profane His treasured place, He sees 
And he knows, and we cannot get away with that. I'm afraid all too often God is warning us about the conditions of our hearts and the way we live our lives through his word and through his scripture, and yet we dismiss those warnings thinking that, well, we have grace and we have mercy now. Well, guess how these people had been redeemed and brought in to be the people of God? Through grace and through mercy. But in reality, what you're doing is when you despise the gifts of God, you're despising his grace which is reflective of a heart that doesn't belong to him or is so steeped in sin that he has been pushed to the very periphery in the corners in places that he is never meant to be. So he goes on from verse 23 all the way to the end of the chapter just laying out problem after problem that is going to befall the people. He's going to bring the most evil of nations to take possession of their houses in verse 24. Verse 25, they will look for peace, but there will be none. 26, disaster and disaster, and rumor after rumor is going to come. Look at the end of verse 26. They will look for a vision from a prophet, and instructions will perish from the priest and counsel the elders. There's going to be an absence of the Word of God in the people's lives. They're going to think that they have this never-ending flow of communication with God because of the presence of the priest and the prophets. But God's going to say, look, there's not going to be a word from me. You're going to be under judgment. The kings will mourn, the princes will grieve. And finally, I will deal with them, the end of verse 27, I will deal with them according to their own conduct, and I will judge them by their own standards. Then that they will know that I am the Lord. Church family, I pray that it never comes to this in your life. I grieve that it came to this for Old Testament Israel, and I never want to see it come to something like this for us as the people of God. May we heed the warnings of Scripture when sin is pointed out by the Holy Spirit in our lives, let us be sensitive to that so, that so that we can continually trust in Jesus who has paid the price for us. These people had to pay the price for their own sin. They lost their homes. They lost their lands. They had to go into exile because they continually rebelled against God and His Word for them. Let us not be like them. Let us walk in the grace and the mercy of Christ. That if we do sin, let us realize, as 1 John promises, we have an advocate with the Father and let us immediately turn and repent and turn back to God. May you and I be marked by hearts of repentance, hearts that we never see in this chapter, hearts that are softened, hearts that look like what comes later in Ezekiel when God says, in you I will take out the heart of stone and I will put in a heart of flesh. Let us be marked by fleshly hearts hearts that God has put into us, that we may walk with Him. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We pray that Your Spirit would cover us and allow us to understand it and apply it in our lives. We thank You for the Spirit, that He walks with us daily. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray together. Amen.